Hello, my name is Vincent. Today we'll be doing an overview of antifolates and antimetabolites, which are considered traditional chemotherapy. So we been, begin by looking at how did we get here. The timeline basically started in 1946 and then goes to current day. The first agent that we'll be discussing is methotrexate. Methotrexate was discovered and started being used in chemotherapy and in treatment of cancer in the 1940s, 1946 to be exact. And it's considered an antifolate. The other antifolate we're going to be considering is called primatrexid, which was uh, approved in 2014. The first antimetabolite we will be discussing is considered 5-fluorouracil, which was discovered roughly 10 years after methotrexate. There is a oral, 5-fluorouracil is a IV compound. There's an oral compound called capecitabine, and it was approved in 1958. So those are the antimetabolites and antifolates that we'll first be considering. To give us some context, though, as far as the development of chemotherapy, in 1959, a product called cyclophosphamide, which is an alkylating agent, which I'll be discussing, discussing in another lecture, was discovered in 1959. So it has a different mechanism of action than the ones in, in red. 1960 in, is called cytarabine. It's an antifolate that we'll be discussing. So everything in red I'll be discussing in more detail as we go along. The ones in white for right now are just to give context as far as development is concerned. Doxorubicin was discovered in 1974 and it was, it's being used, it's an anthracycline and next one is gemcitabine. Gemcitabine is also an antimetabolite discovered in 1983. Paclitaxel is a taxane. It's a microtubule inhibitor. It was discovered in the late 80s and was approved in 1993. And then the other ones that we will be considering are 5 as cytidine and decitabine. Those are the ones we'll be discussing today. Those 5 as cytidine was discovered and approved in 2004. I'm sorry, approved in 2004, and decitabine was approved in 2006. So you can see the antifolates, again, methotrexate and pimetrexid. First one was 1946. The second one was 2004. And then the antimetabolites started in 1957 with 5-fluorouracil and goes up to 2006 in, with this, the cytobine. So that's considered conventional chemotherapy. You can see that runs roughly over 60, roughly 60 years. There are what I consider four ages of chemotherapy. The first age is conventional chemotherapy. The second age started in 1997, which is rituxan. Rituxan is a monoclonal antibody that ushered in what I consider the second age of chemotherapy. The third age of chemotherapy was imatinib, and it's a targeted agent that targets specific enzymes or proteins, I should say, within the cell. And then the fourth age is considered ipilimumab or immunotherapy. So there's three ages. There's conventional chemotherapy. There's monoclonal antibodies in 1997 with uh, rituximab in 2001, imatinib is targeted therapy, and then 2011, you get to immunotherapy. And I'll be discussing the, the um, rituximab, the imatinib, and ipilimumab in future, just future lectures, but for this time, we'll, most, we'll be discussing all the ones in red. Before we start talking about chemotherapy, though, I think it's really important to understand what is cancer. I think most people have some idea what cancer is, but I think it's important to delineate uh, some of the important characteristics of cancer. So cancer can be broken down in 10 characteristics, and the first one I think everyone would recognize would be proliferation. So that's just cells turning over, cell growth. The second one is angiogenesis. This means that the cells are getting uh, blood vessels. They need blood vessels are in order for nutrition and for oxygen. To avoid immune detection, this one's relatively new, and was discovered in that the immune system is basically being tricked. Otherwise, the immune system would attack cancer, but cancer is able to avoid immune detection. Mutations are interesting in that mutations, in a very simplistic way, cancer is 
mutations. It's a genomic mutation. These are within the DNA typically uh, have some type of mutation that leads to some of the characteristics we already discovered or already talked about proliferation in particular. There's also metabolic changes. There's resistant to apoptosis, which means there's resistant to cells killing themselves or suicide. That normal cells, after they grow, and if they grow incorrectly or they have too many uh, aberrations within themselves, they'll kill themselves, which is a process called apoptosis. Cancer cells do not do that. Resistant to growth suppression. So normal cells only grow so much. In cancer cells, they grow continuously and without end. And so they have to, again, characteristic of cancers is to resist growth suppression. Inflammation. Inflammation is just um, the characteristic of cancer. And the last one, I'm sorry, the last two are immortality, which means normal cells only live so long. Cancer cells continue to divide and continue to divide. And they basically, and as the term defines immortality, they do not die. And the last one, the most devastating of all of them, is metastasis. So that means that the, the cancer moves from one site to another site that it normally would not be found in. But for all of these, so all these 10 characteristics, for the most part, those 60 years that we talked about conventional therapy only focuses on one, and that's proliferation. Newer therapies focus on angiogenesis, and the, as I mentioned, the fourth age is... Uh, actually augmenting our own immune system to detect cancer. But we'll be focused on conventional, so we're just talking about proliferation at this point. So what's, what are the sites in the body that have the most cellular proliferation? So the first one would be kidneys and bladder, gastrointestinal tract, lungs, skin, sex organs, and last one would be bone marrow. So these are the most light, these are the, the cell lines, if you will, or tissues that proliferate most rapidly within our body. And these are examples of epithelial cells. So if epithelial cells in themselves constitute the vast majority of where cancer occurs. So this gets right into it. So the question being, what sites are the most likely to develop cancer? Well, we can turn right back to the same, same slide. So kidneys, bladder, gastrointestinal tract, lungs, skin, sex organs, and bone marrow. So example, you get kidney cancer, you can have bladder cancer, gastrointestinal tract, that can be anything from head and neck cancers to stomach and most common like colorectal and, and rectal cancers, and then lungs that could be small, smell, small cell, non-small cell are examples. With skin, the probably most devastating was melanoma until recently. For sex organs, for females, probably the most common one is breast cancer, but you can also get ovarian, uterine cancer. For males, th that would include testicular cancer, but I also would include in that prostate cancer. And for bones, have their own set called hemological cancers, and there's numerous hemological cancers. So of these right here that I, that I just listed, kidney, bladder, gastrointestinal tract, lung, skin, sex organs, and bone marrow, if we just take into consideration those, those areas, it makes up 75% of all cancers, all cancers. So where do most of the side effects occur with conventional chemotherapy? We'll get into a lot deeper discussion, but I want you to just give some context about this. So where do they occur? We go right back to the same site. So they have, you have kidney issues in, as far as what's considered nephrotoxicity or kidney uh, toxicity. You have potentially bladder toxicity, GI toxicity in the form of mu mucositis, which means inflammation of the mucus, the mucous membranes. It could be also very common in conventional chemotherapy is nausea and vomiting. With regards to the lungs, you can get some pneumonitis. With regards to the skin, you can get different types of rashes. And probably the common one I also included skin is hair loss, which is called alopecia. 
with sex, sex organs, you can get infertility, amenorrhea, women will stop cycling, uh, they'll stop, um, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and males will stop producing sperm during chemotherapy, c c conventional chemotherapy. And the last one is bone marrow. And with bone marrow, I want to spend some time with that. Well, you get what you get is called cytopenias, which your, your bone marrow makes up the cells, that, most of the cells that you find in your blood. And so we're going to spend some time talking about mo bone marrow suppression. Bone marrow suppression is called myelosuppression. Milo meaning bone, and suppression means um, not to not to produce. So let's go stem cells. So we'll start here. So this is the hematopoietic system. So you have stem cells. The stem cell basically means it can become many different cells depending on what factors that are around it that stimulate it. it can produce macrophages, basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils. These constitute, the white ones constitute the white blood cells, and they also make up what's considered the innate immune system, which is your second defense against infections. Your first defense means barriers, so your skin is an example of a barrier. Your second would be your immune system, and this is your first part of your immune system, your innate immune system, which doesn't, isn't really specific to any foreign entity that comes in. The macrophages, and in particular the macrophages and the neutrophils, will attack that and, and neutralize it. Next we'll talk about erythrocytes, which are red blood cells, platelets, which form clots when cuts happen, B cells, so B cells are, so on the left-hand side with macrophages, basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, uh, erythrocytes, and platelets, that's the myeloid side. On the right-hand right side, starting with the first one, B, uh, B lymphocytes. It's called the lympho lymphoid line, and the first is called B lymphocytes, and they produce B lymphocytes, or B cells, produce antibodies. So the little Y, green Ys, are considered Ys, uh, antibodies. T lymphocytes also are on the lymph, uh, lymphoid line, and they produce two types of cells, T helper cells and cytotoxic T cells. The one that we'll, I'll be discussing in immunotherapy is cytotoxic T cells, basically cytotoxic T cells by definition. Cytotoxic means cell toxic. So the cytotoxic T cells search out cells that are infected or that aren't functioning correctly, and they um, tell them to kill themselves or help them kill themselves in a sense. So as far as the stem cells, again, stem cells can, can become many different cells. These, this is a, an example of some of the cells that it can, can become. The other one I wanted to mention is dendritic cells. Dendritic cells is a cell line that communicates between the innate immune system and what is considered the acquired immune system. The acquired immune system is the B cells and T cells. So you can see that or you would, you would view dendritic cells as kind of the phone line, the communicator between the two. The, and it allows the innate immune system to tell the acquired immune system what's happening, what infections are occurring, and, and what's the best defense against it. But for our purposes, what we're really concerned about is what happens when we give com uh, conventional chemotherapy. And these are the cell lines we're most concerned about. Neutrophils, erythrocytes, and platelets. And why is that? For one, neutrophils are part of your innate immune system, so that's your second defense against immune, uh, uh, foreign attackers such as bacteria and, and viruses. So if bacteria gets in, as the primary example, is that neutrophils neutralize that. So as I mentioned before in the previous slide, is that it causes myelosuppression, so you actually get decreased amount of neutrophils. Again, makes you susceptible to infection, both bacterial, viral, and fungal. And neutrophils are only have a have a lifespan of about six days. So once you give chemotherapy, in about six days, you're going to see the neutrophils start to decrease in number, and they reach a nadar, which is the lowest point within about 14 days. The second cell line that we're concerned with is platelets. Well, as I mentioned earlier, platelets are responsible for forming clots. Well, if you don't have enough platelets, which is called thrombocytopenia, you can actually have bleeds. So conventional chemotherapy, again, just in general causes a decreased production of platelets and, and therefore makes you susceptible to bleeding. The last one would be erythrocytes. Erythrocytes are red blood cells, which is responsible for carrying oxygen. Allows you, it helps you to breathe. I mean, <laughs> you breathe in order to bring in oxygen, the erythrocyte, erythrocytes deliver the oxygen. So 
thrombocytopenia is considered when you have low platelets, which will occur as early as about eight days. But again, the NADAR is similar to the neutrophils in about 14 days. Fortunately, in, in some respects, the erythrocytes or blood, red blood cells stay around for 120 days. And because of that, you typically do not get what's considered anemia, which is low red blood cells uh, for several cycles or, or, or at least a, several weeks or, or a month or two. But they do occur after if multiple cycles occur or multiple treatments of chemotherapy the last several weeks. So now we have to talk, I think it, it is important to get an idea or understanding of cell, the cell cycle. Uh, to understand cell biology or cancer biology, I'm sorry, we must be familiar with the cell cycle because the cell cycle represents the master controller that determines growth. And being familiar with the cell cycle also helps us understand where and how chemotherapy works, both for con conventional chemotherapy and some of the newer agents take advantage of the cell cycle and where cells are doing specific tasks within the cell cycle. So cell cycle, we start off with a cell, and the cell can go through a G1 phase, or growth one. And the growth one phase, uh, the cells start duplicating a lot of their macromolecules that they'll be using for the next cycle. The only thing that is not duplicated here are the chromosomes. But they also can go into the G0 phase, which means that the cells aren't growing at all. They just, they're resting. They're arrested. So they don't do, they're not, they're not even being considered for replication. The cell cycle in itself is growth. It's, it's a cycle of growth. It's for, one cell potentially leading to two cells. And it, there's many stops along the way to determine whether it's going to go through the cycle. So once it enters the G1 phase, it's basically saying that it's going to start, it's going to potentially start to, to, to grow and to duplicate. The S phase is where the chromosomes are duplicated. So this is S phase for synthesis phase. Each of the the 46 chromosomes that a cell has will be duplicated in this phase. And the little X's represent one chromosome. So you can see after the S phase, you have two chromosomes. After the S phase, we go into the G2 phase or the growth two phase. And the G2 phase is where the cell makes sure that all the components that were duplicated within the chromosome are without error and makes needed repairs. And it makes needed repairs to make sure that that's happening in order that we enter the last phase, which was the M phase or the mitosis phase. Still two chromosomes, but in the M phase, what happens in mitosis is that the cells potentially are divide, and you end up with two, two cells. An identical duplication, which is considered the daughter cell and the original cell. So how does, where does chemotherapy come in, and how does it address some of the, these issues as far as cell division is concerned. So what are the primary cellular targets of conventional chemotherapy? The one we're gonna discuss is nucleotides. And then in for, and we'll discuss DNA replication in a future, dis, future lecture, and we'll also be t discussing microtubules in a future lecture. So what are nucleotides? Nucleotides come in two flavors. You have pyrimidines and you have purines. Pyrimidines and purines are the backbone. And there's different types of pyrimidines that we're going to get to and different types of purines that we're going to get to. This is the backbone for DNA. So the first py pyrimidine that we're going to be discussing is thymine. And it's found only in DNA. Adenine is a purine found in DNA and RNA. And thymine and adenine, you need one pyrimidine and one purine, and they join up together. They're, uh, they join up together in DNA. The other pyrimidine we'll be discussing is cytosine, and it pairs up with guanine. Just to give you a little taste of what we're going to be doing, the thymine, how we attack that and how we deplete the cells, uh, cancer cells from making thymine are with methotrexate, pemetrexid, 5-fluorouracil, and capecitabine. Those ones we've discussed right at the beginning as far as the timeline. So again, those are methotrexate, pemetrexid, 5-fluorouracil, and capecitabine. That's, what we're going to be attacking. That's how we're going to be attacking the thiamine. 
As far as the adenine is concerned, the one at the bottom, the green one, we're going to be using flor- uh, fludarabine, which will be discussed at the end. Cytosine, the pyrimidine up at the top, the purple one, will be discussing. They'll be attacked with f- four agents: one cytarabine, gemcitabine, five acetid, five azacitidine, and dacitabine. In RNA, instead of the thymine, we're going to be seeing uracil. So that's only found in RNA. So uracil takes the place of thiamine. Which is, so the red one shown here, uracil takes the place of thiamine, which is the um, orange one. And I should mention the only thing different between those two is the, is the methyl group. So you see thiamine. I highlight the, the yellow box with methyl group. That's the difference between the two. So what does a nucleotide look like? A nucleotide has a phosphate group, which is the, the phosphate is the P, and the phosphate group is the one circled in, in yellow. It also has a sugar moiety or sugar compound on it, and then it has some type of base. In this case, it's a nitrogenous base, nitrogenous base, and in this case, they're showing an adenine. But there's also, this is the nucleotides for all the ones that we just discussed. So adenine guanine, thiamine, and cytosine. So the adenine and guanine are the purines, the thiamine and cytosine are the pyrimidines. Why is this important? Well, the reason it's important is this. this is, these are the backbones. These are the, these are the chemical. These are the bases. These are the macromolecules, if you will, that form DNA. So as I mentioned, there's pairing. There's base pairing, adenine, and thiamine. Those are always in base. They're always across from each other, and they form a base pair. There's guanine and cytidine. They form a base pair. So if you look at the structure here, the thymine is in red. The adenine is in green. So you see the red and the green always paired up. The guanine and cytosine, the guanine's in purple. The cytosine's in this yellow, and they're always paired up together. And they're held together by what's considered hydrogen bonds. This represents uh, the ba- the Blue, the light blue and dark blue represent the backbone of the DNA, and then the base pairs are in the side that keep the DNA together. So if we turn back now to the cell cycle, where the one we're going to start addressing is in the G1 phase first. And the G1 phase, again, is getting ready for the S phase. So it's making duplications of these nucleotides, some of the nucleotides. And the ones that we're going to be discussing are ones that are particular particularly susceptible or, or need folate, and then we're going to be discussing some that look like thymine. So the antifolates, and we're going to talk about antimetabolites, antimetabolites specifically for thymine. So the, again, we're attacking nucleotides. The nucleotides antifolates, we're going to be primidine antimetabolites, and purine antimetabolites we'll be discussing later on. So the antifolate that we're going to be discussing first is methotrexate, and then we'll be discussing discussing primatrexin. So what does methotrexate attack? So as I mentioned before, thi- it attacks thiamine. Methotrexate is attacking thiamine, and the only difference between thiamine and uracil is again is that methyl group. So we're going to look at that. The next slide is going to show us how uracil, in particular. Uh, DUMP or is going to be changed into thymine, and it's going to be adding a methyl group. So how do we add a methyl group to the uracil to make it thymine? So that DUMP stands for deoxyuridine monophosphate. Again, that's deoxyuridine monophosphate, DUMP, shortened DUMP. There's an enzyme called thymidinolate synthase. So thymidinolate synthase converts DUMP to DTMP, DTMP is deoxythymidine monophosphate. That deoxythymidine monophosphate then adds more phosphate groups. So there's mono, one phosphate, MP, and it goes to TMP, so deoxythymidine triphosphate, so three phosphates. So deoxythymidine monophosphate turns into deoxythymidine triphosphate. Deoxythymidine triphosphate then is incorporated into DNA. So again, we're focusing on macromolecules that are used in DNA and DTM, DTTM 
DTTP is a macromolecule used to make uh, DNA. And as we looked about before, that is the basic structure for DNA. It's the macromolecule that makes the helical structure. So how does it do this? The thymidinolate synthase uses N5, N10, methylene H4 folate to basically take a methyl group and put it onto the thymine and put it on the uracil to make thymine. And it ends up with a byproduct of 7,8-dihydrofolate. Well, what would happen, what happens to the next time that they want it, that you need to make DTMP from DUMP? So that 7,8-dihydrofolate needs to be recycled. And part of the recycling process is to use dihydrofolate reductase should mention the greens are enzymes. So thymidinolate synthase is an enzyme, dihydrofolate reductase is an enzyme. And you would know that not only because it color them green, but because ACE is, is, is an indicator that it, the last ASE is an indicator that it's an enzyme. So 7,8-dihydrofolate is then the enzyme dihydrofolate grabs 7,8-dihydrofolate and uses N, NADPH plus hydrogen to produce NADP plus but by doing that, using that molecule, it actually produces tetrahydrofolate. Tetrahydrofolate is then converted to N5, N10, methylene, H4 folate. So I guess this is a cycle. In order to recycle it, ethylthymidinolate synthase uses the N5, N10, methylene, H4 folate and produces 7,8-dihydrofolate. Then the hydrofolate reductase uses NADPH, and produces tetrahydrofolate, and then tetrahydrofolate eventually gets converted back to the N5, N10, methylene H4 folate. And the cycle can, can continue to go over and over again. So what do antifolates go? Again, because it's an antifolate, it's going to attack the folate, folate regeneration. The first one we're gonna look at is methotrexate. So we look at the same cycle again, we go around, we produce tetrahydrofolate, N5, N10, methylene, and so it recycles and you get your, back your folate. Well, how methotrexate works, it basically blocks dihydrofolate reductase. If you block that enzyme, the 7,8-dihydrofolate cannot turn into tetrahydrofolate. If it cannot turn into tetrahydrofolate, tetrahydrofolate cannot produce N5, N10 methylene. And therefore, you can't recycle the folic acid, the folate. And therefore, you can't put the methyl group on the DUMP to produce DTMP, because you can't produce DTMP, it can't go to DTT, DTTP, and therefore you cannot start uh, replicating DNA, and therefore the replication cycle stops and you don't, you're not able to enter the S phase. What is methotrexate used for? It's used for hemological disorders, uh, hemological cancers, sorry, hemological cancers and solid cancers. So what are some of the toxicities? We talked about some of the toxicities, and I mentioned them, and I'll mention them here again just to help reemphasize that we're going to run into very similar toxicities with all of these because they're all conventional. They all, all indiscriminately affect quick-growing cells, of which we mentioned already, the skin, the bladder, the kidneys, the bone marrow, uh, the lungs, uh, in the GI tract. So you're going to see a common theme between all of these. They're going to have a very similar side effects. I mean, I don't mention all the side effects here. I do mention uh, some of them and kind of the, the ones that are outlined outside of those ones we've already discussed that most of them have. But we'll start here. Cytopenias are basically what I talked about before. You get myelosuppression and you get cells, all kinds of the cells in particular that we're concerned about, again, are the neutrophils. Uh, in neutrophils and platelets and red blood cells eventually. You also get elevated LFTs, liver function tests. So methotrexate is a hepatotoxic, as are most of these drugs. So you're going to have your LFTs. You're going to kill some hepatocytes. Depending on the dose that you give, you can kill more off than others. As we mentioned before, it can also have ac acute renal function, so acute renal failure. Uh, so the methotrexate is, can cause cytopenias, elevated liver enzymes, and acute renal function. A unique component of methotrexate is that you can give it in high doses, which means that's over 500 milligrams per meter squared. When you give it at these doses, you have to be very careful and you have to have some measures in order to rescue the individual. Otherwise, 
if there's no rescue measures instituted, the individual will actually become toxic and potentially die. So some of those measures that you do use of the management of this is hydration, urine alkalization. So hydration is used in order to eliminate the methotrexate from the body, so urinate it out primarily. The urine is alkalized in order for the methotrexate to be more soluble. In order, when the urine is alkalized from seven to eight, you get a five to eight fold increase in excretion or solubility, I'm sorry, of the methotrexate, and therefore you're able to urinate it out. The other component is to avoid drug interactions. And drug interactions can either, most of them, what will, they'll do is they'll prevent the elimination or heighten the toxicity of methotrexate. I'll mention some of them here. Amphotericin is an example, uh, aminoglycosides, chloral hydrate, uh, and, and, and NSAIDs, penicillin, penicillin derivatives, probenicid, proton pump inhibitors, salicylates, and Bactrim DS. Those are all examples of agents. That's an ex not exhaustive list, but that's an example of some agents that will interact with methotrexate in order to and cause methotrexate toxicity. So these are three items or three management, three ways to manage high dose methotrexate. The, the fourth way to manage it. Is, is called Lucavore and Rescue. So let's go back to our folate, recycling folate. So we'll go all the way through again. And again, when methotrexate comes in, it basically eliminates tetrahydrofolate, doesn't allow it to come around, and then you don't get N, N5, N10, methylene, H4 folate. But you can actually give the individual IV, Lucavorn, and therefore reestablish it. So what happens typically is you give them high-dose methotrexate, you wait 24 hours, and after 24 hours you institute the hydration, you alkalize the urine, you make sure there's no drug interactions, and then you give them leucovorin. And by doing that, that rescues the individual from the toxicity of the uh, methotrexate. And also, because the methotrexate was able to sit around for 24 hours, it has its therapeutic effect. And leucovorin is only used in order to rescue the individual. One other thing to keep in mind, oops, sorry. One other thing to keep in mind with methotrexate is that if it's going to be interthecal, it should be preservative free. So preservative free interthecal for interthecal use. The next antifolate that we're going to discuss is pemetrexid. So pemetrexid, go back to our, our folate, recycling folate, so thiodimylate, thiodimylate synthase converts DUMP to DTMP again, and we see this again, same message, but in this case, pemetrexid actually inhibits thiodimylate synthase, and therefore, same thing happens. So the endpoint is the same thing as methotrexate, it's just uh, activating, or I'm sorry, inhibiting another enzyme. So thymidylate synthase is inhibited by pemetrexid. Dihydrofolate reductase is inhibited by methotrexate. So same endpoint, different ways to get there. Pemetrexid is indicated for non-small cell lung cancer. It also is indicated for mesothelioma. Toxicities, again, same toxicities that we talked about before. Myelosuppression, skin rash, and diarrhea. So GI side effects, bone side effects, skin side effects, GI side effects, and pulmonary infiltrates. So lung side effects, again, kind of what you would expect from a conventional chemotherapy. There are ways in order to reduce these toxic effects with pemetrexid, and they're instituted this way. There's folic acid, 0 0.5 to 1 milligrams given daily, and vitamin B12, 1 milligram, one week before you know, the start of pemetrexid, and then every three, every third cycle thereafter, and then you continue that for one cycle after, or four, three weeks after the last last pemetrexid dose. And they, this intervention of folic acid and B12 reduces the incidence of myelosuppression, or the severity of myelosuppression. It doesn't completely eliminate it, but it does reduce it. One way to reduce the skin rash that occurs with Pemetrexid is to use dexamethasone, four milligrams orally, twice daily, day of treatment, and day after, and that will minimize the rash. Another thing to keep in mind with Pemetrexid is that if the creatinine clearance is less than 45 milligrams per mil, then 
they should not be used. We talk about anti-metabolites now. The first one we'll talk about is 5-fluorouracil. And then the second one we'll talk about is capecitabine. 5-fluorouracil is the IV form. Capecitabine is the oral form or the prodrug of 5-fluorouracil. So 5-fluorouracil, where does it work here? It doesn't work on dihydrofolate reductase. It doesn't work on thiamidylate synthase directly like the permatrexid. What it does is 5-fluorouracil, as the name indicates, 5-fluoral. So there's a fluorine group on the 5 position of a uracil. Through multiple enzymes, it produces fluoral DUMP. So it looks like DUMP, except there's a fluoral group, fluorine group, I'm sorry, a fluorine group on the 5 position. So the thymidylate synthase thinks that it's going to pick up DUMP, but actually it's picking up 5 DUMP. When it picks up 5 DMP, it actually is a, what's considered a suicide inhibitor, and it basically knocks out that enzyme. Again, if the enzyme doesn't work, you can't produce DTMP, you can't produce DTMP, you can't produce DTTP, and you can't produce DNA. So this is the anti-metabolite in the sense that it works like the DUMP, but it because of the floral group on the five position, it actually knocks out the enzyme. When the enzyme picks it up, it knocks it out and prevents it from working. So 5-fluorouracil is indicated for solid tumors, primarily a lot of GI solid tumors. The toxicities are, again, the same as what we've been seeing, so cytopen cytopenias. This is a little bit different. This is a hand and foot syndrome. It basically is the breakdown of skin uh, on, the, on the palms and on the palms on the bottom of the feet. This is unique to 5-fluorouracil. you got vasospastic angina, which can occur right after an infusion of 5-fluorouracil. So remember we use leucovorin to rescue individuals in getting methotrexate. In this case, we're going to use leucovorin in order to potentiate the effects of 5-fluorouracil. So why does it do that? So again, we go back to the same cycle that we've been talking about. 5-fluorouracil is going to come function like DUMP, the thymidylate synthase is going to think it is, and it's going to inhibit it and cause it suicide. But in order for thymidylate synthase to work, to function its best, it needs that N5, N10 methylene H4 folate. Well, leucovorin, remember, actually is converted to N5, N5, N10 methylene H4 folate. So you preload individuals with leucovorin initially so that enzyme thymidylate synthase is working as best as it can and is fully active, fully engaged, and then you give the fly floor uracil in, a, in order to inactivate it. So you're revving it up, making sure that it's a fully functioning, and then at the same time you give it a suicide inhibitor. They're revving it up by giving it leucovorin and then in 5-fluorouracil. If that leucovorin wasn't present, then the thymidylate synthase doesn't work as well. And if it's not working as well, then it wouldn't pick up the 5 floor uracil or the 5-dump uh, in order, I mean the F-dump, in order to become a suicide. So Cape Cytobine, as I mentioned, is the oral form of 5 fluorouracil and it has, and its basically indications are colorectal cancer and breast. Has the same side effects outside that the hand and foot syndrome is a little bit more with Cape Cytobine, and because it's oral, you end up with more GI side effects. So we're going to move away from the folic, the folic uh, antifolates, and we're going to start looking at DNA replication phase or the S phase. So we went through the G1 phase with the antifolates, and in particular. Uh, we looked at the antifolate or anti-metabolite, sorry, 5-FU and Cape Cytobine. Now we're going to be looking at the S phase. Again, the S phase is where we uh, duplicate chromosomes. And we go from the 1X that I'm showing below to the 2X. And in this case, we're going to look for anti-metabolites that are used in the S phase. So what, anti what anti-metabolites can we be using? We're going to be using nucleotide analogs. So those molecules that look like the nucleotides that are needed in order for DNA replication. So we're going to go back to our pyrimidines, and we're going to go back to our purines. So we already talked about thymine, for the most part, preventing the production of thymine using methotrexate, primatrexid, 5-fluorouracil, and capecitabine. Now we're going to be looking at cytosine. And cytosine, in particular, we're going to be looking at cytarabine, gemcitabine, 
5-Ase of Cytidine and this Cytidine. These are pyrimidine. Again, we're still doing pyrimidine analogs. So uh, the Cytarabine and Jamcitabine we'll be looking at first. Then we'll be looking at 5-Ase of Cytidine and then we'll looking at this Cytidine. So we'll start with Cytarabine. So what does Cytarabine look like? If we look at Cytidine, the next one is deoxycytidine, le reading left to right. And that de deoxycytidine is what's used in DNA. So that cytidine must be converted to deoxycytidine in order to be put into DNA. Well, if you look at the last structure on the right, that's cytarabine. And the only difference is the hydroxyl group at the two prime position. So you can see structurally it looks I nearly identical outside of the hydroxyl group. And that's when the DNA picks it up, it's picks it, picking up cytarabine, thinking it's deoxycytidine, and it incorporates it into the DNA. But by incorporating it into the DNA, or picking it up even, the DNA polymerase is inhibited and therefore cannot have DNA. DNA polymerase is necessary for DNA replication. So the cytarabine inhibits DNA replication. We're still in the S phase, so it can't replicate the DNA, and therefore the cell will apoptose because it can't produce the, the DNA. Or it can stop the DNA chain elongation. So it can get incorporated, and then the, the chain stops moving. And again, you just don't get replication. Cytarabine, the indications are all leukemia. So acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoid leukemias, meningeal meningeal leukemias. And the side effects, what would we expect? We got cyt cytopenias, cerebellar toxicity, which is a different. Again, I mentioned these just because they're a little bit different than the other ones. Cerebellar toxicity means it has it's neurotoxic, and these patients need to be checked frequently to make sure that they're not getting neurotoxic on it, and you get conjunctivitis with cytarabine. So to minimize these toxicities, one, you use allopurinol. Allopurinol is used during leukemias because you get a lot of cell death. Because a lot of cell death, you potentially put the person, you, you increase the amount of uric acid, and you get a thing called tumor lysis syndrome. I'll talk about that in a future lecture. But basically, allopurinol prevents tumor lysis syndrome from happening during cell lysis or a lot of cell lysis. You can also use dexamethasone in order to prevent the conjunctivitis, the eye conjunctivitis. And then, as I mentioned, you need uh, monitor neurological function. So the next pyrimidine analog we're gonna be discussing is gemcitabine. So gemcitabine, we're gonna put all three of them next to each other now, deoxycytidine, then we just talked about cytarabine, and you look at gemcitabine. So cytarabine, as I mentioned before, the only thing different is that hydroxy group versus the, the hydroxy group doesn't exist in deoxycytidine. Well, how does that one, how does gemcitabine differ? All you have is a fluorine group. You have two fluorine groups instead of the hydroxyl group there. And so, again, it's going to basically match and look like deoxycytidine to the DNA polymerase. And it, similar mechanism of action, it inhibits DNA repair, it, in, it stops DNA chain elongation, it inhibits ribonucleotide reductase. All this is saying is that it's going to inhibit DNA. It's going to in inhibit DNA from, it's going to inhibit that cell from progressing through the S, S phase and into the G2 phase. Gemcitabine is used on numerous hemological disorders and solid tumors. And the side effects are, again, kind of what we'd expect. We get myelosuppression. Our GI side effects is gastrointestinal epithelial ulcers. This can also cause abnormal liver function because it's hepatotoxic. Next one, next pyrimidine analog is 5-Ase of cytidine and dacytidine. I'm taking these in conjunction because you'll see structurally they're very identical. They have the same side effect profile and they're used for the same, same cancers. So if we look at structurally, going back to cytidine, and 5-Azacytidine is that the, now we're not changing the sugar component of the, the nucleotide. We're changing the base. So the 5' prime area, so 5' prime azacytidine, you see a, a nitrogen added for 5-Azacytidine. 
for the dacitabine, you see a nitrogen added, and then on the two prime position, a hydroxyl group is removed. So th that's the main difference between the two. But as far as mechanism action, they're going to do the same same thing. Is they're going to inhibit DNA methylation. So this is not inhibiting DNA replication. These actually get incorporated in, into the DNA. And once they get incorporated into the DNA, the DNA is methylated. The DNA is methylated in order to, for, for certain proteins to be made, or for certain gene recognition. So there's, when it does, it prevents methylation, it changes the gene's ability to be expressed. If it changes the gene's ability to be expressed, it actually changes the type of proteins being made in that cell and therefore cause the cell to die. This is used in myelodysplastic syndrome and AML. Toxicities are primarily myelosuppression. Now the last one we've talked about, so we talked about pyrimidines, thiamine we took care of, and cytosine we just discussed. With thiamine we talked about methotrexate, permetrexid, 5-fluorouracil, and capecitabine. With cytosine, we talked about cytarabine, gemcitabine, bivazocytidine, and decitabine. We haven't talked any purines yet, so the only purine that I'm going to focus on is adenine. And the drug chemotherapy that we're going to use for adenine, I mentioned at the beginning, but I'll mention here again, is fludarabine. These are purine analogs. We were talking about pyrimidine analogs, now we're at purine analogs. The purine only we're going to discuss is fludarabine. So fludarabine, kind of same thing, same story once again. So fludarabine looks like adenosine. All outside of you have a floral group there. That's the only difference. But that floral group makes all the difference in that uh, it's similar mechanism. It's going to, be, I'm sorry, it had to, I'm sorry, you have a fluorine group and you have a hydroxyl group that's different too. So you can have the hydroxyl group added. And that fludarabine is going to get incorporated into DNA and prevent, and it's going to inhibit DNA polymerase. It's going to cause DNA chain termination. And the same thing happens that the S phase is no longer, it's not able to progress. And therefore, it can't go through the cell cycle. The cell is not able to divide. And therefore, the cell dies. Fludarabine, the indication for fludarabine is chronic lymphocytic lymphoma or CLL, toxicities are what we would expect. So the toxicities is, are, is myelosuppression. I'll reemphasize myelosuppression makes the individual an increased risk of opportunistic infections, infections in general, most common, or probably respiratory infections. Fludarabine does have also, we, we talked about um, neutrophils, but in this case, the fludarabine is also toxic to the lymphocytes. So you get lymphopenia, so you get decrease in T cells and, and B cells to some extent. And that can, I'm sorry, just mostly T cells, but that can persist up to one year. And that will conclude our discussion about antifolates and antimetabolites. I hope you join me, I uh, hope you enjoyed this discussion, this lecture, and I hope you join me for future lectures. Thank you.